Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. According to the preacher, no matter what you do, you are doomed to the one faith that awaits everyone. Are you a righteous man? Are you wicked? Can you, by your actions, determine the outcome of your life? Since all share the same fate, does it matter? For the author of Ecclesiastes, it does matter, but not in the way that you imagine and not in a way that makes sense, unless you accept that all deeds and all things, both good and evil, are in the hand of God. Richard and I discuss Ecclesiastes chapter 9. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 79 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We are back with the preacher, again trying to figure out what the point is in all of this if everyone is going to enjoy the same fate. And I think the word enjoy is a tricky word. It's a word that he plays with a lot in this text. Right. One of the things he's struggling with is that there are a lot of bad things that happen in life, like having to work really hard and all the anxieties that come around work and all that, but also things that we have to enjoy in life. And death means the end of all the toil, but death also means the end of everything we enjoy. And I think he's trying to figure out how to balance these two sides. And we've seen that this has been a theme, trying to balance the good and the bad, being too wise, being less wise, being more righteous, being less righteous, all that. Trying to find that balance. What I love about this chapter is that the preacher seems to take the same approach to stress that I do. (laughs) And he takes the same approach to stress that the 60 million refugees roaming the earth right now have no choice but to take. And I want to talk about this a little bit. Because I'm frustrated with the attitude people have about mainstream issues in the United States, the things that we get hung up on in the news cycle. And while we're sitting here talking in circles about all this irrelevant nothing, there are 60 million people today who woke up who don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Or if they do know, they know that they're at the mercy of someone else's generosity. They don't know what happened to their families. In some cases, they don't know where their parents are, and these are children I'm talking about. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what their future is. They don't know if they'll ever have any normalcy again in their life. They don't know anything. This is real stress. What we call stress in the first world, having to work extra hours at night, or being inconvenienced, or not having enough time to watch Netflix, all of this is baloney. These people have real stress. And I think hearing a text like Ecclesiastes forces you to consider this grace but also the judgment that comes down, that is handed down with this grace. It's not enough to say, thank God, I'm not a 12-year-old from Syria who lost his parents and who had to walk across to try to get to Europe to see if someone will take me in. Thank God I'm not that orphaned 12-year-old. It's not enough to say that. It's not enough then to pray for the orphaned 12-year-old as people do in churches, in the few churches that actually care about what's happening in the world today. It's still not enough. You have to then look at the life that you've been handed and ask yourself, whatever I'm doing with my hands, am I doing it with all my might? Am I making the absolute best use of the time that God has given me? And I think that there's a strong element of that in this text. He's not saying that there's one particular thing you should do, but whatever you do, since you have the opportunity to do it, Do it with all your might and be thankful for it. So why do I mention stress? Because instead of running around trying to figure out what therapy to do and what exercises to do and how to meditate, all the stuff people do, why not pick up the mantle of your stress and embrace it and give thanks to God for the opportunity to bear witness to the suffering of that 12-year-old child, that orphan of war, that refugee, 
take it as an opportunity to bear witness to their suffering, knowing full well that your first world stress is a gift. Somebody who lost everything in a civil war or in some kind of a terrorist attack or whatever's happening in these societies, it's not just Syria, it seems to be everywhere today, it's a disaster. Someone who has lost everything and has to start over and may not even be able to start over would give everything to have your stress, whatever it is, guaranteed. That's the context in which we have to hear the preacher today. And I think as we go through the text, you'll see, at least from my perspective, Richard, how that's the context in which you also have to hear the letters of Paul. Because the urgency of the one faith that each human being shares, I think, pertains to the urgency of the coming of the Lord and the day of judgment, which Paul always insists is right around the corner, which is very interesting. Anyways, let's jump into the text. For I have taken all this to my heart and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. If you're righteous or if you're wise, whatever you do, you can't say, oh, okay, this is a good thing. You do your thing like you're saying. You're wise, you're righteous, you just do your thing. But the deed, whatever comes of it, it's up to God. Paul says, you can sow seed, but what kind of increase comes? That depends on God. You can sow like a righteous person, but sometimes the seeds come up, sometimes they don't come up. It's not up to you. You have no power over it. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. You don't know if you're a righteous, wise person. People might end up hating you. His point there isn't about hatred and love. His point is that you have no control over outcomes. And I think your example of sowing seed is apropos. You do the work that you are assigned to do. And in biblical parlance, the work that you're assigned to do is the work that appears in front of you. It's whatever's in front of you. Right. And that'll come out later in this narrative. And don't be indignant if it doesn't come out the way that you wanted or if it seems like it came out the wrong way. No, because as Steve Jobs said in concert with the preacher, the journey is the reward. So enjoy sewing, even if it's difficult. Enjoy sewing. Don't worry about what's going to come of it. It's not your business in a way. This is old school. And unless you have been someone's apprentice you will never understand it. Because in Western societies, we want to know the outcome of what we're doing. We want to know what our boss is thinking. We want to be part of the story. Want, and I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just what we want and it's how we function. But in a classical teacher-disciple relationship in any field, the disciple is forced to do mundane, boring, difficult things all the time. You may not even be allowed to see the full picture of what you're doing. Well, it's like the story of the Desert Fathers where the spiritual father makes a spiritual son go plant sticks and go out and water them every day. It is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. This is a theme that has come up again and again, and it's like everything in this book, it's like it's in an echo chamber and it gets louder and louder and more forceful. He's still reflecting, ruminating on this point or trying to help us embrace this point. You cannot differentiate yourself. There is no differentiation. There's no differentiator in Boot Hill. The only differentiator is the size of your tombstone, as you said recently, and even that will fade to dust. Sooner or later, the pyramids will be gone. And scripture will have been right in its mockery of the pharaohs. It's only a matter of time. Scripture will outlive the pyramids. Everybody goes to the same fate. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun that there is one fate for all men. He's saying it's not fair. But he's not whining that it's not fair. He's just stating a fact that life isn't fair. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives afterward they go to the dead so not only is it not fair but human beings are evil and they're crazy and then they end up going back to the dust yeah people are full of a lot of opinions about how things should turn out what's good what's bad they have their judgments on their actions on other people's actions and the outcome of their actions the outcome of other people's actions and then the people and the actions all go to the grave this is the point that i keep making 
There are outliers where people have problems that are destructive to themselves or to their neighbor physically. There are people who have psychological disorders that are abhorrent and they need help dealing with them. But for the vast majority of us, the things that we call psychological disorders, the things that we choose to call psychological disorders are part of the human condition. Embrace it. You need to accept the fact that the human condition is what it is and stop whining about it. Because if you embrace life and you embrace what God has given you as life, therein you will find wisdom and joy. And therein you will find in biblical terms what success is, which is to make the most of what you've been given, not to lose time trying to repair it. What are you trying to make yourself into? What is your paradigm when you're trying to repair a human being? What is your paradigm for what a good human being is? It's a philosophical dream. The preacher is telling you in plain Arabic, everybody is screwed up, everybody is evil, and everyone's going to the same fate. So what do we do with this business under the sun? I think this is a very important question, and I think it reflects the wisdom of Genesis chapter 6. Because God's solution in Genesis chapter 6, when he regretted having made the human race, was to accelerate the one fate for all. But yet... God showed mercy. And notice, after he hit the reset button in Genesis chapter 6, he didn't fix human nature. That's not the point. The point is what you do with what God has given you. And what's interesting about this is what makes something good or evil has nothing to do with our categories of good and evil. Because everything that pertains to the human being, the value of everything, relates to how it is used and how it functions. I can't say it enough. When you accept that, then it is God who is the judge and not you. And the thing that you're trying to fix with your psychologist might be the very thing that God uses to save your brother. In the first verse, their deeds are in the hand of God. Absolutely. That's how it, that's how it ends up. For whoever is joined with the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. So then he has to go back and say, okay, well, the point is not to be dead. Actually, there's some point to being alive, and being alive somehow is better than being dead, which is funny because before he was talking in previous chapters about how being dead is better than being alive. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. It's like a kid taking a flower. I, she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She lo you remember the cartoons they used mm -hmm. to do that? That's what he's doing here with the question of meaning. And at the end, the girl is standing there. Just dump the flower and kiss her, and you'll find out. It's not rocket science. You can sit there trying to figure it out, or you can live. He's challenging you here to live. This is the direction this text is going. Right. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward for their memory is forgotten. So the advantage that the living have over the dead even though they know they will die, they're conscious. So if you're a conscious person, what do you do with that knowledge that you're alive? That's what it's trying to say. If you're a mighty person who's dead, nobody cares about what you think because you don't think anything anymore. And in verse 6, indeed their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, right? You want to sit here and evaluate, is it wrong to hate, Father Mark? Isn't hate a sin? Is too much zeal bad for you, Father Mark? Should we love? Why can you talk about love and hate? Were they wrong because they hated and also loved? This is the way people talk. It's vain talk. His point is, it doesn't matter because they no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Parenthetically, you do. And for you to hate is a better portion than to have no portion of the things that are done under the sun. Now, that does not work with the philosophy of virtue and goodness, but scripture is not dealing with Hellenistic philosophy. Because all your love and all your hate are perishing. All of them are gonna to go to the grave. You know, you talk about all the questions these questions come from the desire to judge now. We need to judge. We need to judge ourselves. Am I righteous enough? Judge the other people. Why are they so evil? Feeling sorry for ourselves. This should not be happening. You were talking about stress. A lot of times stress is just saying this shouldn't be happening to me rather than just saying this is what God has allotted me under the sun. A sower went out to sow his seeds in Mark and you only know the outcome because the one who is speaking is telling you the story after it's complete. And it is impossible for a living person 
to tell their story. You can't tell your own story. Yeah. That's why all of this autobiography nonsense, it's baloney. Go then, eat your bread and happiness, drink, drink your, your wine, wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved, approved your, your works. Life. Let your clothes be white all the time. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given you under the sun, for this is your reward in life, and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. So we've worked, and we have a family, we have food, we have drink, we have oil, we have all these things that can make life enjoyable. So you can't say life is full of evil and you're going to die because there's too many counterexamples. You can enjoy your time with your wife. Go sit on the deck. Maybe you're just eating lentils and rice. Eat lentils and rice outside and enjoy the sunshine. When you see your spouse, instead of whining that they don't do enough for you or you don't like what they do or whatever stories that the wealthy invent in their heads that produces divorce, whatever narrative you're telling yourself, forget about it. Just be happy, embrace your spouse, see the good in them, enjoy your time with them, the same with your children, with everybody around you. And remember when you're doing it, remember the 12 year old who just washed up on the shores of Greece has not a dime and no adult in his or her life and trying to get to Germany to you know make a life for themselves. Remember that child has no one. Remember that and honor your spouse for the sake of that one child. I remember talking to people in Morocco when I lived there. The people there are poor in a way that most Americans have never seen poverty. As a white person, we have this affliction of white guilt, which is complete vanity. And Fortunately, say, I don't have white guilt. I would say, who am I to be eating this good food when there are these poor people who don't have this food? And you go and you say this to someone who's really poor, and they would say, why not eat it? Correct. What, unless you're going to give it to me, who cares? So eat your food, you poor white guilty person. I mean, white guilt. Don't get me started on white guilt because you cannot expiate the shame of the Holocaust by giving someone else's country away. So please don't get me started, okay? But you're right. Instead of not eating the food that you're given because you eat the food that you're given and share it with as many people as possible because you honor that person's suffering by trying to help other people suffer less. And then the time that you have to do work, what does the preacher say? He says, enjoy life with the woman you have and so forth. But whatever your hand finds to do, and this pertains primarily, I believe, to the toil at the end of verse 9, but it applies also to enjoyment. But whatever your hand finds to do, verily do it with all your might. Parenthetically, do it and honor the person who is suffering. Honor other people who don't have the opportunity to do because you have the opportunity, honor the dead. They no longer have a voice, but you have a voice, you have hands. For there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. I want everyone who tells me that they're assured of entering the kingdom and being with Jesus to read this verse over and over again. There is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. So use your strength in this life to do as much as you can, and that includes toil, but it includes enjoyment. You do as much as you can in life because you're going to die and it's all going to be over. So just get it done now. Again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability for time and chance overtake them all. And I would call verse 11 the verse of providence or the providential verse or the verse that explains what providence is because that's how life works. I would call verse 11 that life is not fair. Which I call providence. <laughs> How's that sound? Perfect. However, providence twists around life is not fair and makes out of it something beautiful, which is what he's doing here. So you're going to be dealt a card. It's your card. He tells you it's evil or it's not evil, but then he still says enjoy it and do it. Right. Don't weep about your cards. Just play the darn cards. Play the cards. Play the cards. Embrace your stress because I don't care what you say. There's nothing that could happen in Minnesota. There's nothing that could happen to you that is worse than what is happening in Syria right now or Afghanistan or Greece or any of these poor places. Moreover, man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. So do what you do. Life is not fair. You're going to die before you're ready. So just get it done now. Whether it's toil, whether it's enjoyment, do it now. Also, this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, 
And this is something in scripture, this expression, and I want to check the Hebrew here, gadol. Here it's translated as impress me. Do you agree with that translation? Yeah. It's interesting in scripture that someone would say that something impressed them. So let's see this wisdom under the sun that impressed the preacher. There was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man. Now this is a recurring theme, interestingly. Mm -hmm. A poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war but one sinner destroys much good. We know that wisdom can overcome brute strength, but we also know that brute strength can overcome wisdom. And this is the yin and the yang. They're always going to be at odds with each other. They're always going to exist with each other. He doesn't say one is going to win in the end. They're just going to be always circling each other. Yes, one poor wise man can defeat an entire army. But guess what? It doesn't take very much for a whole army to defeat one poor wise man. And what happens with that poor man in the end? Everyone forgets him anyway. It's a challenge for our Western idea of progress, where we can say there's this battle against racism, and there's this racism that's overcoming our country. Yet there was one poor wise man, Martin Luther King, who came and he fought against it, and he turned the tide, but then they ended up killing him. So now where are we? Well, we want to establish this time when there's no more brutal force against people in our country. Look, here's another wise man. He's going to defeat them. But then they're going to defeat him. And we're going to go through the cycle again. And it keeps going over and over again. This idea of progress in the Western world, this chapter shows it doesn't work that you way. You cannot progress beyond the text. And I'll end with an example to really stress this point. You have a priest who explains the gospel. You come to the liturgy on a Sunday, he opens the book and he reads it. It's the same story your parents heard. It's the same story your grandparents heard. It's the same story their parents heard. That story is repeated every generation. The one who is reciting it to you publicly will meet the same fate as everyone else has met and will meet. He will be gone. He will fail. He will not overcome evil. He will not achieve anything of his own accord. But the next generation will read the same story, and each time that story is read, the same wisdom will be shared, the same benefit will be shared, the same enjoyment under the sun will be shared, the same understanding of providence will be shared, which turns life into beauty and grace. And everyone who will have shared that will be gone. Life is not fair. There's always what we see as progress, but it may not be progress. There's what we see as evil. It may or may not be evil. But since we are alive today, and we don't know what the outcome is going to be other than one day we're going to die and not be ready. Today we do with all our might whatever we're doing. And in that context, better to choose the portion of the wise man. So says Father Mark. Thanks, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. Take care. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.